Good afternoon, everyone. Please join me welcoming Dave talking about timing. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name's Dave Chinner, and I'm here to talk to you today about a timing system that uh, I've built for a motorsport event. Uh, the event is the Bulladeela Hill Climb, uh, run in Bulladeela, and the car club that runs it is the Mile Lakes Motorsport Car Club. Um, I first ran the Bulladeela Hill Climb as a competitor in 2009. Um, I first helped run it as an official in 2012. Um, I've been the assistant clerk of the course, the clerk of the course, and the last couple of years I've been the event secretary. Uh, I'm now also the head timing official. So the talk today, uh, I'm going to go through a few things. Uh, some basic stuff like what is a hill climb event, because some of you may not know exactly what that is. Um, what are the requirements of a timing system for a hill climb event? Uh, the high level overview of the system that I've built, some of the hardware, bits about the networking, uh, the software that I've written, and what ended up happening on last September when we ran it for the first time. So, a few things there. So, first of all, uh, a hill climb event. Um, a hill climb event is a tarmac event. It's a single car event. Uh, it's generally point to point rather than a loop on a circuit. So, the start line and the finish line are in physically different locations. Um, it's often held on a closed road, uh, sometimes on a, a closed circuit, um, but overall it's the lowest time between the start and finish that wins the event. Uh, so what we're really interested in is the elapsed time between the start and finish line. Uh, so the Bulladeela Hill Climb, um, this is just a little satellite photo of where it is. It's out in the old Pacific Highway, if anybody recognises the old Pacific Highway at Bulladeela, it's a notorious stretch of road uh, up and down a couple of mountains, and B-doubles are not fun on that truck, that road. Uh, the, between the start line and the finish line down here, it's 1,150 metres, so we've got more than a kilometre uh, between the start and finish. Um, Coming into turn two, speeds of the top cars are roughly 160 to 170 kilometres an hour. Um, and through the finish line, you know, once we put the second chicane in up here to slow the cars down, around 150 kilometres an hour. Uh, before that top chicane, uh, we were having cars pass through the finish line and going over the crest 50 metres after the finish line at over 200 kilometres an hour. So it's a fast event. Um, and that leads into certain uh, safety considerations and other requirements that we have to build into the timing system. So the first generation of the timing system for this event was essentially a 1.2 kilometre wire uh, that was run from the finish line all the way down to the start line and there was someone on the finish line that pressed a button when the car went through the finish line. And when that button was pressed, a light bulb lit up at the start line and the guy with the stopwatch pressed the stop button. <laughs> 1.2 kilometer long wire is a long wire. Um, the second generation uh, timing system, which was built about 10 years ago, uh, used infrared beams across the road, uh, microcontrollers uh, connected to parallel ports on laptops, um, and then a uh, VPN and a remote server in Sydney and a 3G network connection um, and the software was written in Ball and Delphi. The maintainer of that system retired a couple of years ago and because of family circumstances no longer capable of maintaining it and running it for the event uh, and so being the car club's know-how computers work guy, um, the question was asked, Dave, uh, can you build us a timing system? And so here we are. 
So once again, you know, being a hill climb, you need to know a little bit about how the event is run because that influences the, the timing system and some of the functionality that it has to have. Uh, we have to uh, group cars, uh, we run cars up the hill grouped in batches. We don't have the space to put 50 cars at the top of the hill uh, after they've all run up the hill, so we have to limit them you know, 25 cars at a time. So there's multiple groups to a run and we run the cars up the hill one at a time and then bring them all down in a batch uh, back to the, the pits. So they come out of the pits into the marshalling area as a group, then they stage at the start line, run up the hill individually, assemble at the top and come back down as a, a group. Uh, before we start a group, there's protocols, safety protocols to make sure the track is clear and it's safe to run. Uh, that's done via radio checks with all the flag points um, and the finish line official clears everything to say that there's nothing on the track. Um, and because it's a single car event and the rules of the event and the insurance that we run under and things like that uh, require that there is only one car on the track at a time, uh, we have certain uh, interlocks and safety interlocks in our processes to make sure that that happens. So Bullet Dealer Hill Climb, there's a few uh, unique challenges that we have to deal with. Um, the first, one, first ones are environmental. Uh, I've already mentioned the distance between the start and finish line, but what I didn't mention was the terrain. Um, it is heavily forested uh, land and it is extremely steep. There is no line of sight, there is no direct radio communications between start and finish, and so we have no real way of communicating directly between the start and finish line. All the radio comms use a repeater station that's up on top of the hill and we can't use that for data. Uh, we have temperature and uh, and uh, other environmental problems. Uh, we've had, run, had to run on a 40 degree C day. Uh, we've had to run uh, during heavy thunderstorms. So everything has to be waterproof, it has to operate in the sun and in the heat of the day. So there's a few things there that we have to consider as well. Um, it's in the middle of a forest, there's a bushfire risk. We've got 500 people on that hill on a day. Um, so that's a significant consideration for the, the safety. Um, it's also a public road, the time and location. We're on a public road, we have it closed for 12 hours, we have to be able to set up and tear down and run the event all in 12 hours. So we can't use fixed uh, infrastructure, it has to be brought in on the day, put together, pulled down and left pristine as it was at the end of the day. And so that kind of limits some of the technology that we can use. We can't use transponder-based timing because that requires timing loops and wires in the surface of the road and we're not allowed to dig up the road. Um, and that stuff is somewhat expensive and we don't have an unlimited budget. So it has to be designed really about available, cheap, off-the-shelf technology. So I mentioned some safety considerations. Um, We've got a few that I haven't mentioned. Uh, everything has to fail to a stop condition. We can't have a system fail with a green light on. Um, if something goes wrong, uh, the system has to make sure that it doesn't start another car on the track. Uh, that's for the safety of the officials that might be on the track, uh, the car that, and driver that has stopped on the track for whatever reason. Um, we have uh, to keep that in you know, that interlock in place, we generally use a human in the loop uh, control system. So while it could be completely automated, at some point between each car starting or finishing and the next car starting, there has to be a human that says it's okay to go. Um, and there's other little things like we do delivery of timing results to the nominated phone number via SMS. And so if that's the driver and they've got their phone in their pocket, we don't want to be delivering that SMS to them two seconds after they cross the finish line um, and are still doing 150 kilometres an hour. Because what do drivers do when their phone goes beep? <laughs> yeah, on a crest too. On my part, there's also knowledge constraints. I haven't built any custom hardware or anything like this for 20 years. Um, I didn't have time 
to learn a whole new platform and environment. Uh, microcontrollers, the IDE, the libraries, the compilers, how to flash them, all of that sort of thing. I had six months from start to finish between two events to actually design and build this. Um, luckily, however, if I go back 20 years when I was building custom hardware, um, I have some prior experience with wide area distributed time synchronization to sub millisecond accuracy. So I already knew how to do this uh, and a solution that would work. It was just a matter of whether I could build within all of the constraints that were, we had. There are a few other little requirements. Um, the accuracy and precision of the system, um, the Confederation of Australian Motorsport has it defines the minimum precision accuracy that you need for an event. For a club event, hand stopwatch to a hundredth of a second is fine, but if you want to run a state or national level event, uh, it has to be electronically timed uh, and it has to have at least millisecond accuracy and precision. Um, we want the system to be fault tolerant because if we don't have a timing system, we don't have an event. So if something fails on the day, we want to be able to, you know, like the communications, we need to be able to run the system manually in some way. Um, we want it to be usable by anyone on the day. So the officials that actually use it don't need any special training or any special knowledge to use it. Um, so the only person is, that needs expertise on the day when something goes wrong is the chief timing official, uh, which would be me. Um, and of course I've mentioned the SMS results delivery. Um, so a little bit about the system architecture. Um, this here is all of the hardware that built the system. That's why I don't have all of the hardware here. I have some little bits of the hardware, some of the control boxes um, and so on here with me. So if you want to have a look at them uh, afterwards, come up and see me. But yeah, I couldn't bring all of this equipment and set it up here for you, unfortunately. So the way it's architected is essentially a set of uh, nodes in an IP network. Uh, the time synchronization uses the GPS network, the great clock in the sky, uh, to, to do the work for us. Uh, the messaging between the nodes is relatively simple and trivial, so a, uh, MQTT is more than capable of doing this sort of thing. Uh, power supplies. Uh, I don't want to be carrying lead-acid batteries around everywhere, and I've got endless numbers of 18-volt power tool batteries sitting around, so they're a perfect, perfect use for these, this situation. Uh, the timing beams are all off-the-shelf industrial infrared uh, uh, emitter transceiver pairs um, and there's a laptop that is used for all of the uh, UI for controlling it and monitoring the state of it. So a node. Um, the node is uh, basically is based around a beagle bone black wireless. There are several reasons for that. I mentioned I didn't want to build a new, learn a new platform, so I was looking for something that was a fully capable Linux uh, system. That's where my expertise is. Um, the beagle bone black is a fairly large footprint, uh, so the proto capes that you can get for them, you can actually fit a lot of functionality onto a single cape. Uh, the Wi-Fi was very, very useful um, because it meant that I could connect to it remotely from my laptop without having to open it up and connect uh, cables to it. Uh, there was a plan B for fallback uh, with the real-time processing cores on the BeagleBone, which turns out I didn't need to use. Um, but the other side of it was is that a Raspberry Pi could have done most of this stuff, but the cost of the underlying hardware wasn't really the issue. It was whether there was a plan B if plan A didn't work. And the Raspberry Pi, there was no plan B. Um, so that was a, uh, uh, the, the, the base choice, the, you know, the first choice that had to be made. And then there was the custom hardware cape that needed to be built for it. Um, all of the external sensors, the start lights, the finish lights, uh, and so on and the external hardware that's needed to provide the communications between all the nodes on site. So 
what is actually node hardware? Well, it's an IP67 enclosure, so that's your waterproof enclosure, and all of the connectors on it are IP67 rated as well. Uh, there's an external power switch, there's a uh, 10 to 60 volt uh, uh, 10 to 60 volt input regulated power supply, which can output five amps at five volts. Uh, the GPS is an Adafruit Ultimate 10 Hertz GPS that has a pulse per second output. Uh, the pulse per second output is the important part and that's what makes the GPS actually the expensive bit. Uh, there's four optically isolated relay outputs for driving lights, uh, powering the timing sensor, the, the infrared sensors uh, and various other things. There's optically isolated digital inputs which are used for reading the timing beams when they change. There's LED outputs for status information uh, on the box itself and button inputs for operator control. Um, and there's a USB port on the side of it uh, that gives, that's for plugging in a 4G LTE modem, which gives us the wide area network comms. So the custom design CAPE, uh, that was designed in KiCad. Um, I mainly used it for defining, you know, the schematic tools for defining all the wiring connections. What did I need? How did they all get connected up? Uh, what pins did they connect to on the, the, the general purpose I.O. Uh, you know, expansion book connectors on the, the BeagleBone Black and so on. Um, and realistically, that part was actually quite easy. Um, it's a manually made, this turned into a manually made uh, uh, proto board, uh, jumper wire, things like that. I prototyped a PCB design um, to help work out how to lay it out properly and make it nice and easy to, to, to wire. Um, and if I need to make more of these nodes, then I'll just go and get that PCB made rather than doing it manually. Uh, the first prototype, um, this was getting the first little bits of it working, having outputs dri driven and the GPS functional uh, sitting on my desk. Uh, the, the timing sent, the infrared beams, they're actually powered up, as you can see by the LEDs on top and talking to one another. They weren't wired in as inputs at that point. Um, this first prototype was essentially the GPS, the relay outputs, and two opto-isolated inputs, which is enough to bootstrap development. Um, it got retrofitted to, with the, uh, the input buck converter, which is sitting down on the board there right now. Um, so, yeah, this was used for all the initial software development, um, and going through that process of doing the, the, the hardware bring up like this, the software put me through seven circles of hell. Um, it was not pleasant and I learned all about the bad things to do with device tree and GPIO and various things like that. I don't have time to go in that, that's a whole new presentation in itself. Um, there's bonus slides at the end if, you, if I've got time. So this is the version two hardware. So I should point out that this box here has got the version one hardware in it. This one here with all of the switches and LEDs on it, that's the version two hardware. So the version two hardware, uh, this is where I was making the two, two, two of them in one go. We've got the BeagleBone Black, uh, that's the bottom of the board, that's the top of the board, and that's the off-the-shelf relay board. Um, so the, the second version was I designed and built uh, after I'd done the software prototype, uh, and that indicated the need that the box needed status outputs, LEDs on it, and control inputs, switches um, for it, for the local operator to know what's going on and do what they need to do. Um, it got the, rec the power supply added to it. There was the switch inputs, the outputs, another couple of opto-isolated inputs. It was a deeper enclosure so I could lay things out internally differently. Um, and that's where I added all the IP67 external connectors. Um, and I ended up using just simple jumper plugs for all of the internal connectors like these here. Um, because that it's not subject to vibration, no need to screw things down, and this made it really easy to unplug the board if I needed to and swap it out with something else. 
So the external hardware, uh, we have a transmitter that's running off a, a power tool battery and we have over here the receiver on the start line uh, and that's powered by the, the actual box itself. Um, so they're banner engineering 960 nanometer transceiver, transmitter receiver pair, infrared sensors. These particular ones have got a range of 60 meters. Um, the finish line used a different type that had a range of 30 meters. Um, they're good because they have LEDs on them that indicate uh, alignment and beam strength indication. So two people can simply, or one person even, can sit there and watch, just move the transmitter around and watch whether it's correctly aimed by how fast the LEDs are blinking on top of the receiver. And so when the light goes on solid, you know you've got it aimed properly and that's all you have to do. The reason this was good is that I could set up a beam in under 30 seconds. And because we've got limited time to set up and tear down, uh, being able to set things up, this entire setup here, the start line, the start lights, that box there which has got all of the, it's got one of these underneath it and everything that's connected to it, um, that took 10 minutes to set up. The finish line was a bit more challenging because the distance between the control box and the finish line beams was 40 metres and the finish lights, which was 120 metres, um, and there were two beams rather than one. And so It took a bit longer to set up, but it still took under 30 minutes. So from start to finish, setting up the control node, getting the laptop connected up, all the comms coming up and everything going green across the board, the setup time was about 75 minutes. Um, I had planned to take, allow two hours for it. Um, I had three hours maximum and was well under the time that I'd budgeted to be able to set it up. So that meant we could do other things at the time. So the software. I'm going to talk about the application software here, not the hardware bring up software. Um, this is the software that actually runs during the event, the timing software, the control, the safety logic, all of that sort of thing. Uh, to do the initial bring up, um, that it just basically needed to read inputs from the hardware, control the output so it could cycle through the lights correctly, um, and do the right thing based on the beam breaks, send simple events. You know, we've got a start event, we've got a finish event, the timestamp that's associated with it, um, and get those things into a basic UI uh, so that we can see that the core functionality of the system would actually work and then start to implement some of the you know, run logic and the group logic and the, the safety interlocks that were needed uh, to it. Um, and one of the things I looked at with MQTT is that there's command line uh, clients that you can use for sending basic messages. And I decided that was a good thing because I could use message mocking uh, to simulate the missing start line or the missing finish line while I worked on the other node. Um, and so I could work on one part of the system and simulate the rest of the system being there while I developed it. And so that allowed uh, a fast uh, development test cycle iteration as I started to build up the system. And I could start in one corner and just as I filled it all out, uh, get that one bit running and then move on to the next bit and not have to worry about the whole system and getting all the messaging working and whatnot. Um, and it solved the chicken and egg problem. So. I used Python to do all of this initial prototyping. Um, it fitted all the basic needs. Uh, there were the distro, I'm just using Debian on these, these things. Uh, multiple MQTT and GPIO Python libraries are supplied as default by, by uh, the, the Debian uh, user space. Um, so I had a choice of things to, to, to use. It didn't take very much to be able to drive outputs, read inputs, um, and Python has TK module built into it, so it's really easy to do a quick uh, UI uh, through that without really having to think about it. But 
it has its downsides too. Uh, the code grew complex really fast. The logic wasn't, you know, the control logic, the safety interlocks, the messaging, all that. Um, once it started to get to put together, it, it did get complex quite quickly. Um, MQTT uh, is all callback based. It wants to run its own event loop. Um, and TK, well, it wants to run its own event loop too, and it's event driven. Um, and GPIO, uh, that wants to run its own event loop too, um, but you can't get timestamps out of the Python GPIO libraries from the kernel. Uh, and so if you're not blocking in that, you have to actually run high frequency polling to get, say for example, millisecond accurate or close to millisecond accurate timestamps for the change of event. You have to do that from user space, which means things need to run real time and whatnot. Um, and that then caused problems because now you're talking about, I need to run this bit in real time and that means I need threads and whatnot. So when you then thread MQTT, it doesn't like it when you send a message from one thread and run a call back in another one and it just, you know, it has internal locking so it's supposed to be thread safe but it has deadlocks and whatnot. It really got complex very fast um, and there were issues starting to show up. Um, the Python died though. Um, the MQTT libraries, I tried each one of them. I rewrote the code a couple of times to use the different MQTT modules, um, but they just wouldn't run reliably. Just running a simple message ping from one process to another via the MQTT server on, the, on, the, uh, on local host, um, it would just die randomly after two or three hours. And all it's doing every five seconds is going, are you there? Yes. Are you there? Yes. And that would die. It would, there'd be an internal exception and it would crash one of the processes or it would fill a socket buffer and just not send anything else. Just go dead silent. No warning, nothing, and no way to recover it. So this is not good enough for something that we need to run all day and run reliably. Um, that we, I might have been able to deal with, but the GPIO interfaces uh, had other problems. Um, they randomly didn't work correctly. Um, there was a 50-50 chance on starting the process that the inputs would work correctly. It would read and see them all. There was a 50-50 chance that the outputs would start in the wrong drive. So start the process up and it turns all the outputs on but I haven't told it to do that. The worst part though was when exiting or crashing, which occasionally happened, um, the, the GPIO would simply lock up. It couldn't be used again. You couldn't change its state because something got lost in the process context that the kernel holds for the GPIO and you couldn't open it up again and start and reinitialize it. So you had to reboot the box because your Python script died. It was not debuggable with my level of Python knowledge, skill, and so on. So I pretty much walked away from it um, and went to V2. Uh, and I went back to what I know, uh, which is basically multi-process uh, modules uh, written in C. Uh, I separated the hardware interfacing from the messaging from the control logic, all in separate processes, uh, and all of these processes communicated via persistent log files. I didn't use Shemem uh, magic pipes or anything like that, because one of the things I wanted to be able to do is if there was a failure of part of the system, I wanted a persistent log so that I could reconstruct the events that occurred and not lose timing information. Um, and that was actually useful on the day of the event because that enabled, to me, enabled me to recover uh, bad timing events. 
Uh, so it was all written in C. I still use Python for the UI and various other functions, but all of the critical control system and timing system was now written in C. Uh, there were run scripts to execute everything because it's multi-process and make sure things restarted if something failed. Um, system D was used to start everything up at the start. Um, and each node had its specific configuration defined by a config file. Uh, so there was a different config file for the start line from the finish line from the control box itself. And which configuration file I selected to determined what that node behaved as. So I could pick the box up at the start line, take it to the finish line, plug it in there, and just change the config file it used, and it was now the finish line. So that meant that I didn't have to carry many spares because any box could perform the function of any part of the system. Uh, so the timing node modules. Uh, there was an input reader process. Uh, it's a real-time process, uh, threaded using Sketch FIFO. Um, and it would sit waiting for a, uh, a change of the GPIO inputs from the beam, from the timing beam. So a car goes through the beam, it breaks the beam, it edge triggers the GPIO. Now the kernel then timestamps that change in the hardware interrupt. So it's basically as fast as the kernel, um, as fast as the kernel can respond to the interrupt, you get the timestamp of it occurring. Uh, and that come, you can get that out of the kernel through C, through the pole interface, uh, which means that I didn't actually need to use any of the real-time hardware in the BeagleBone. I've got high accuracy uh, event timestamps time stamped down to nanoseconds uh, from the kernel itself. Uh, there was an output writer process, a remote comms process for MQTT, um, and then there was the control loop process, which did all of the application logic. Uh, as I mentioned, cross-process communication was via persistent log files, um, and there we go. So the control logic modules were different for each node. Um, the start line controls the light sequences for staging, so when a car comes up to the start, light, start line um, to, to get ready, they need to know where the start beam is and be aligned to it. So we'd bring them up and they'd break the start beam and that turns the orange light on the start lights on. Uh, and then they roll back and when the beam, you know, they, they move out of the beam, the light goes off and they're in the correct position to start. So that means the moment they start moving, they break the beam and they get the start timing event. Uh, the finish line does, things diff does different things. It has two beams, and the time difference between the two beams gives, them, gives us the uh, speed that they run through the finish line. Uh, it also enables us to determine whether there's been a spurious event uh, on the finish line, such as uh, a leaf blowing through one of the beams. Um, and that happened, and that happened twice on the day on September. Um, which the system flagged as suspicious times, um, and I was able to go back to the persistent log files for all the time, all the beam changes, and get the actual correct uh, timing events for the car going through the beams, uh, reconstruct the, the, the timestamps and the speed through the beams, and actually get correct times for those cars. Um, so the PCU, the primary control unit, uh, it's the one that runs all of the automatic control algorithms. Um, it's the one that interfaces with the start line and the finish line and has the safety interlocks in it um, and contains all the state that is displayed by the UI. It's essentially the brains of the system. Um, it tracks the health of all of the nodes uh, and so on. And, and without that, we don't have a you know, an automatic control system. Um, if the comms go down, nothing can talk to the PCU, and so if we didn't have a plan B, that would be the timing system out. But because we're logging all the timing events to persistent log files, there's another thing that we can do. These boxes here have a manual button on them. So on the finish line uh, and the start line, if we want to run without comms, uh, to get the start line to go from, you know, once we've staged the car and it's in the right place and the light is red, if we want to start the car, you press the manual button. 
and that will make it go from red to green. And so now we have a start event as it breaks the, the event, it breaks, breaks the beam, and in a log file. And on the finish line, when the car is started, the, the uh, official on the finish line can press the manual button on the finish line, and that arms the finish beam, so the next breakthrough then will record a finish event. So we end up with a set of log files on the start line and the finish line that has all of the timing events that we need to construct the results of the event. So if the comms go down and we can't bring them back up, we can still run the event. We just don't have times on the day of the event and they have to be post-processed to construct the run times, the speeds and everything like that. But that still allows us to run the event. Because um, if we don't have a timing system, we don't have an event. So the comms module, uh, there's no control logic in that at all. All it's responsible for is taking events from the, the log files and formatting them into over-the-wire messages um, or receiving over-the-wire messages and writing them into log files. Uh, and so that's how the whole system communicates. Uh, the problems of having with MQTT uh, are now isolated completely to the, the comms module. Uh, and that means that if something goes wrong with the comms, it doesn't affect the timing at all. It doesn't affect the, the input being, you know, the timing being timestamps or anything like that that's generated by the other processes. Um, and so that's the isolation, that provides the isolation that allows us to run the system in manual mode if necessary. So a quick uh, timing event example, what happens during that? So the ca say the car starts, um, we break the timing beam, uh, the input reader process wakes up because it's been in pole, it's got an event, it wakes up, it generates a log entry. The control process, process then wakes up because it's sleeping in pole on the log files. And it says, oh, I've got an input event. And it reads it out of the log file, determines what it's for, whether it's a, a beam break or a, a beam clear. If it's a beam break, it then says, ah, we've got a, a, a start event. And it processes it, grabs the timestamp out of the event uh, and does what it needs to and writes the start event out to a different log file. Because we've also had a start event, we've got to go from the green state to the red state on the light. So we've got to change an output. So the control process also uh, writes to the output control log file. Uh, and the output process wakes up, processes the command from the log file, and changes the output state, then goes back to sleep. Uh, because we've written a timestamp, uh, a start time event, the comms process wakes up sees that in the log file, uh, formats the event message that it's going to, set to the, send to the primary control unit and publishes the message to the MQTT server. Primary control unit receives that over the, the network through the MQTT uh, subscription that it has. Uh, the control logic calculates the, the what's happened, oh, it's a start event. Okay, so that means I just store that time. I'm now going and send a message to the finish line to arm the finish line, uh, and then waits for a finish event to come through. Um, the finish line does all that same stuff and sends a finish event back to the primary control unit. It reads that in, um, and so now we have a finish event and a start event. It calculates the elapsed time between the two and publishes a result event. Uh, the UI is sitting there listening to all these things going across MQTT um, and it logs the result events, the time events um, and, and, and those things. The results module that's running on the laptop, uh, that receives the result event, it stores it in the SQL database that's restore, store, storing all the uh, results and it queues an M SMS up for sending to the phone number it got out of the database for that car that was run and after a minute's delay, it sends that. So all of this is based on a certain amount of network configuration. Um, the networking has to work for, you know, everything has to be able to talk to each other to be able to do this. So once again, 
I didn't have time to invent something new, uh, so I just used the tools that were provided by the distro, and in this case I used Connection Manager because that's what the default Beetlebone distros actually use. Um, so on the wireless side of things, it provides both a client and an AP. The AP is used to, for diagnostic purposes. I connect up the laptop to it, uh, you know, just walk up to it, oh, there it is on the, the, the SSID, connect to it, and I can now SSH into it and do stuff locally without connecting, out ha having to connect uh, uh, wires to it. Um, the configuration for the actual uh, MQTT comms, the remote comms and so on, it's all DHCP based. So I can walk, power all these up on my local home network and they talk to the DHCP server there and they get all the information they need, gateways and so on, all the host names, and they only need to talk via host names between the start line and the finish line and so on. They don't care what the IP address is, they just know it. Um, if I want to do testing out in the field and I don't have the, the 4G network set up, I have a router, a wireless router that has the DHCP server and all the host names set up and everything like that and, and they automatically connect to that. And so I can set it up anywhere in the field that I need to to do testing such as like at the local car park where I can drive the car around and around and around and around and make sure it all works properly. Um, and then of course out in the field if I've got the 4G modems plugged into it, it sees, oh, we've got 4G modems, I don't have a host name, I'm going to start up a VPN over the internet connection that I have, and it then gets all the host names and configurations and so on from the VPN server that it connects to. So there's a little bit of external server-side configuration here, but the result is, is that I can basically plug it in wherever it is, and it just, you know, powered on, and everything comes up, and the laptop, all the little green, all the lights on it go green to say, we've got comms across the board. Um, and that means if anything goes wrong on the day, all we have to do is power the box off, power it back on, and it will automatically connect back up no matter where it is. So the UI, uh, very simple really. Um, what we've got here is the node status themselves, the comms status, uh, they're all saying they're down because it can't talk to anything because of course when I took this screenshot off my desktop a couple of days ago, nothing was powered up. Uh, for the the, the running of the system, uh, we were talking about uh, running cars in batches. Uh, this is the run control, so start a group, you know, and that will then arm the system um, to say, you know, we've cleared the track via radio, we're all safe to go start the system, and then once we've got all of the right inputs, it will go green um, and start running the cars up the hill. One of those inputs is the car that is currently staging, the number for it, so that's the competitor number on the side of the car. Um, and that's used as the key for all of the messaging. So the start event, the finish event, the result event, that's all based on this number here. Once the car has gone green and it's on the track, this none will turn to five, and the next car that stages, I'll enter the car number there. Uh, the timing events, the start and uh, finish events show up here as a, a list in a scroll box, uh, and the actual calculated results show up here, the car, the time, the speed, and whether it's a suspect time or not. Results processing, uh, like I said, SQL database, I just, you know, there's Python to insert the events. Um, you know, it's once again an MQTT listener. Um, it caused some problems on the day. It was relatively simple code. Um, I ended up writing it six hours before the event because that was the last thing I needed to do. Um, and that was the only part that actually caused any problems. So the event performance on the day uh, was actually successful. We had 120 cars uh, run up the hill um, and only two times were irrevocably lost. And that was my fault to begin with. Uh, we had a comms failure, uh, we had to reboot a box, and I let them run before the time synchronization on the node that rebooted had actually synchronized, and so the times were off. Um, the setup and teardown times were better than expected. Uh, there were lots and lots of timing beam breaks as we cars went up the hill and then were brought back down the hill and so on. Um, many more than I expected. I expected to be maybe a thousand events and there were over 5,000 flagged, um, recovered bad times that the system uh, flagged uh, correctly, 
Um, the comms were marginal for most of the day, and so we had several comms failures, and the comms came back. So all of that preparation for the comms system, automatically reconfiguring itself, worked really well. Um, the worst delay waiting for the comms was less than 10 minutes, and that was because it was raining. So we had rain as well, the system didn't get water into it, so the environmental conditions uh, that we had to deal with uh, worked fine. But like I said, the, 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 the code that was the problem was the SMS sender. Um, it crashed repeatedly because, well, it was Python? No, it was just because I didn't have time to test it properly. Um, that was the last thing that I had to write. So overall, um, it was actually a success. Lots of future improvements. I've got a whole list here, but I don't have time to go through them. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Um, and if you have questions, I don't think we've got time for some questions, but I will be outside afterwards uh, so you can ask any sorts of questions. Big round of applause for Dave. <laughs>